I want to change that because the lawyers have to realize that makes them a better lawyer. And as I said, that's what causes the negligence complaints, the uh, complaints, the lost society. And, you know, they're, they're just these benefits of doing these innovative practices that make the clients happy, make the lawyers happy. So welcome to the podcast, Lori. How are you today? Fine, thanks. How are Good. you? I am I'm doing well. <laughs> it's a day. <laughs> so I was so excited when you reached out to me to be a podcast guest and I was reading through everything you've done. And I just would like for you to share a little bit with the audience about who Lori Pafka is and how long you practice law. First of all, thanks for having me on the show. I'll try to be relatively brief, but being a lawyer, that's not easy when talking about oneself. Uh, well, to start with, I'm Canadian. I don't know how many Canadians you've had on the show, but I was born and raised in Tor- Toronto. Uh, but for the last 48 years, I've been living in Ottawa, capital of Canada. And for over 40 years, I practiced law in Ottawa. Interestingly, I started off in general science at the University of Toronto because Ever since I was a young child, I was going to be a dentist like my father. And uh, so I started out in science, but I soon found that I didn't like science and wasn't very good at it. Fortunately, I didn't uh, get into dental school. It was good for me and for the general public. I'm not a dentist. So uh, soon after that, I decided to take economics and commerce courses because I wanted to be an accountant. And I moved to uh, Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, which is on Canada's East Coast. Interestingly, in Toronto, my father, as I said, my father was a dentist. And my mother had been a nurse. My brother was a doctor. My uncle was a doctor. My uncle was a dentist. Everyone was dentists and doctors. I didn't even know any lawyers. But I moved to Nova Scotia and switched. My future father-in-law was a judge. My wife's brother was a lawyer. She had three uncles that were lawyers. Everyone was a lawyer. My roommate. So started thinking a little bit about being a lawyer. And I liked my commerce law course. So I went to Dalhousie Law School with Ken's first law school. I think it was one of North America's first law schools, actually. It was a great law school to go to. Halifax was a great city to live in. Got married there. Was ready to settle down there. Got a job offer. But my wife got a job in Ottawa because she has a master's in public administration. So we decided to move to Ottawa. And... Um, I uh, thought so we'd come back after a year, go back to Halifax, but we stayed. I was saying, and the rest is history, like they say. Yeah, practice then. Uh, in Ottawa, uh, I was lucky that a uh, law school um, classmate uh, was from Ottawa. And he wanted to start his own practice and wanted a partner. So the two of us and one secretary set up our own practice where we took anything that walked through the door. Soon after, I started doing uh, zeroing in on family law, wills and estates. But at first, I did criminal, corporate, did, did a bit of everything, which was good to know what the other areas were like. But uh, I was mostly a family law lawyer, but I always say to keep my sanity, I did uh, uh, wills and estates. But the other thing I was involved in, which is relevant to today, is uh, I was always active in continuing education, both in uh, uh, organizing courses and presenting and writing papers. I did a lot of those throughout the years because I enjoyed doing it. And my main focus, though I did write a little on substantive law, was law office management, uh, which they taught us nothing about in law school, nothing at the bar ads. And and I, my theory is the only people that are really teaching it now are the insurance companies because they know that's what causes claims and the law societies know that that's what causes complaints nothing to do with knowing the law. It's all to do with how you manage your, your firm. And I felt lawyers lag behind quite a bit. We're not evolving in business, how they manage their firm. And so I was interested in that, both in doing it and researching about it. Uh, I had one of the first websites in Ottawa in 1995. Uh, we were the first firm to actually advertise when it was allowed. I don't know if you know your history, but not until 1977 could lawyers in the United States advertise. And then the Supreme Court decided they could. So uh, we started advertising. And, but I mostly tried to 
to try to think of innovative ways to improve the service to my clients. And that's what my book is all about. And that's what I taught all about. And I'm just trying to improve the way lawyers practice law and to enjoy it more. I was going to say, I think it's really important that you talk about the business side of the law, because to your point, that part is not discussed in law school, right? They give us all the theory. Right. Uh, Actually, for my book, I did a survey uh, and only 31% of law schools even have a course, and it's not even a great course in law office management. And I also had an article someone had sent me written 30 years ago, and the same 31% is all they taught back then. And so it's not being taught everywhere uh, for a number of reasons. I talk about that in the, in the book. And uh, I want to change that because lawyers have to realize that makes them a better lawyer. And as I said, that's what causes the negligence complaints, the uh, complaints, the law society. And, you know, they're, they're just these benefits of doing these innovative practices that make the clients happy, make the lawyers happy. So that's my background. Yeah. And you definitely have a really, really diverse and in-depth background. When I was preparing for this interview, I was like, okay, let me flip through your book, see if I can get some excerpts of it, which I did get a chance to look at. But also you have written at least 25 different articles on everything from division of assets to minor children What is it about writing and putting your thoughts on paper that you enjoy so much? Well, there was two aspects of it. Whenever I wrote a paper, I had to do the research. So I would learn something and that would make me a better lawyer. And also some of the articles you mentioned were for for clients. I mean, I wrote for lawyers, but I wrote for for clients too, because I found, especially remember I was primarily a family law lawyer, You'd say something to a client and they're, they're emotional and, you know, would go in one ear and out the other. So, uh, and there's so much to absorb. There are so many issues in family law. So if you put it in writing and they have something to fall back on, don't have to take all these copious notes, uh, when they're, they're with you. Also, it was a marketing tool. I lived in the suburbs and there was a community paper. I used to say if they ran out of ads, they'd print my articles. <laughs> and then when the, when the, I am. I started pre-internet. That's how old I am. So when the internet came along, I had a million articles to throw right on my website right away, which is why I was runner-up in the best website contest in in, in Ottawa. <laughs> Wasn't a lot of competition in 1995, but uh, still. Uh, That's pretty cool, and I think it's very innovative that you would say, "Hey, the internet's a thing. Why don't I put it up on my website?" That's really smart. I think we were the most wired city in the world at one time. It was new, and uh, and people told me that they they chose me because they liked my website and they liked the free information. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's always beneficial to help people and give them free resources. So, Lori, you actually are the first Canadian lawyer I've spoken to when you are a lawyer. So, great. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to ask, I, I saw that you, you know, you had high school, you had undergrad and then law school. Is law school similar to law school in the States where it's three years and it's a postgraduate degree? Yes, but we have fewer law schools and fewer lawyers per capita in Canada, a lot less. So it's very hard to get into law school in Canada and you can't take it at uh, a night and night school. You have to get into one of the, I don't know, eight or nine established law schools we have. I can't remember how many. Mm-hmm. Eight or nine in Ottawa? No, 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 no. in the the country. I'm trying to think of the country. Ohio has nine law schools. Well, uh, there must be 10 to 15. Okay. Uh, So it's different. So it's harder to get into. Yeah. So you told us your story about how you thought you were going to be a dentist, right? You you come from a family of dentists and and doctors and nurses. And then your wife's family is full of lawyers. And so you ended up going the legal route. What was it? I mean, do you remember, was there one moment where you were like, hey, my father-in-law's cool. Okay, I want to be just like him. Like, was there, what really sparked your interest in going? Uh, actually, it was a commerce um, course. You know, it was not law school caliber, undergraduate, but I found it of interest and I did well in it. And hey, everyone around me was a lawyer, so why not? You know, you know? 
then it sort of fell into it, just like I fell into going to Halifax from Toronto. Yeah. That was a big move to you never know where the wind's gonna blow you. Yeah. And when we came to Ottawa, my wife had never been to Ottawa in her life. And we moved here and I had been here for three days, you know. Yeah, but now Ottawa's home. Yeah. Okay. So Lori, you actually wrote a book which was published by the American Bar Association called right. Innovative Legal Service it's, Applications. Yes. yes, a guide to improve the client services. I know yes. it's a mouthful. My son gives me a hard time. Couldn't you come up with a better name? Well, that's the best I could do. That's the shortest name, and that's nine words. That's the yeah. That title encompasses everything, but that's great. So what exactly is an innovative legal service application? Well, that's a good question, and I answered that right in the book because... My family had a problem with the word application. I said, I, I, I've used every thesaurus there is. I can't come up with a better word. Because uh, application connotes in this world uh, a technology. It's, it's not technology. I mean, it is any physical item or any activity in processing a client's file uh, that helps serve the client better. So, for instance, I used to have a second monitor on my desk for the client only which is, I think, a great idea, which I can get into. And that's a that's a physical thing. I gave my clients manuals uh, to hold their file and things, information. I gave them, that's physical. Uh, an activity is something like uh, uh, getting client feedback at every stage, something lawyers don't do. Uh, may, they may do at the end, but after every major area, get, get, uh, get the feedback through a formal a survey. A website's an application that improves the service at all three times when you're dealing with, with the client, and that um, uh, that serves the client uh, better. So, even though it's not original, it's to, you can improve upon it. That helps? It does help. And honestly, that's, I mean, that is being a lawyer, right? You're taking something that was either has precedence from a course ruling or precedence from a book and you're improving upon it or you're finding a different angle for what your client is going through, you know, right? Well, right, and you can't buy a product that doesn't have a manual. So why shouldn't a lawyer, you know, uh, give a client a manual also that uh, helps, like say, organize a file and uh, give them more information? So what would you say are some of the benefits of these applications? Is it just a marketing tool or what? No, that's a good question. And actually, I have to admit, I first started off as a marketing tool. Hey, how am I going to, because books, you know, I have a million marketing books you have over there. And then, you know, titles like Innovate or Die, you know, Differentiate or Die. Okay. I like to say, I don't think a lawyer has ever died for not being innovative. Uh, so it's first started off as, as a marketing tool, but I'm different. In fact, my slogan, Little Hokey, Discover the Pasco Difference. Of course, a little different. In my case, I was different, okay? But anyway, yeah. while researching for this book, and I realized the statistics were that uh, 18% of complaints or law or negligence claims, except for criminal law, which is different, were because you didn't know the law. The other 82% were all related to management and serving clients. So having these applications, you're going to reduce the uh, your uh, negligence claims. And almost the same statistics are identical statistics are applicable to complaints to governing bodies. They may not have been monetary claims but complaining about their lawyer. So it had that big benefit. The third, another big benefit to me, well, happier clients, obviously, but it also made for a happier lawyer. As we all know, a lot of lawyers don't like being a lawyer. That's why you have your show that uh, you have all these people. Now, nah, I couldn't stand being a lawyer. I went on and did other things. Well, this this made me a much happier lawyer. I felt creative. Time spent not just working on file work. So made for a happier lawyer, happier clients, reduced claims, creative, all those things. But the big thing is marketing because the reality is uh, if we don't evolve, uh, we're going to go like other species. We're going to uh, disappear. So instead of, you know, innovate or die, it's evolve or die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's correct. Okay. So what's the use of these applications? 
some 83% is all based on management. Is that like responding to your client in time, you know, those kind of client management type things or what? Well, communications is a big one, 40%, I think. And the and another huge one is not getting all the facts, not uh, discovering all the facts in the case. One thing I did back, you know, 30 years ago, which is what I liked about my website is I had detailed client questionnaires. Okay. So clients could fill them out at home, could do them electronically, send them in to me. And you could ask a lot more questions that had a lot more time to think about. They were less stressful about it rather than writing it out in the lawyer's waiting room or being asked these questions. Uh, so you, you discover more of the facts. Uh, in fact, in custody cases, and I stole this questionnaire from some ABA book, but so you had about a 20 page questionnaire. You want custody. Are you the one that takes the children to the dentist, the doctor, to their playgroups, to this, to that, and that? All these, all these little things, getting all the facts out, which you can do much better with the detailed questionnaire rather than at an interview uh, where a client is sort of pressured under stress. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because most clients lie. And if they're not lying, to your point, the pressure of just being there, sometimes they're just not being completely for. Coming my with all the facts. My clients never lied. I only represented the <laughs> good guys. Actually, I, I mentioned that in the book. Uh, it's a problem. Most lawyers believe that their clients are always telling the truth. It takes a while to realize that you may not have the the good guy, and maybe your client is not telling the truth. Yeah, maybe. It took me years to figure that out. <laughs> maybe. So in the book, you talk about three different periods where service is really important. Can you elaborate on those different time periods? Yeah. Uh, it's, a lot of lawyers don't realize that there are three time periods. They think of, well, the only time I service the client is when they've signed the retainer and they're in my office. But there's two other big periods of time, and that's the be- just like any other product, the before and the after. And the before the retainer is where the website comes in. Well, with a good website, you're helping the, law- the client decide who to choose as a lawyer, get some basic information, especially in family law. People uh, separate. They have no idea what their rights are. It may take a couple of weeks to get to see a lawyer. But if they go to a website and get some some general answers, you know, I mean, every case is specific. But if you can calm them down with some uh, letting them know what kind of information is going to be needed, what the issues are, what the basic law is, you're really serving your clients. Even before they retain you. Okay. And uh, as far as the after goes, uh, I'll switch to wills and estates. One of the things that I did in wills is uh, when someone signed up their will, I said, can I write your executors and tell them the, you know, where the will is, uh, give them a couple articles what their job responsibility is, uh, and who's holding on to the will. If it's at a certain bank, what bank is that? If I've got it, tell them that. Or if it's at your home, where it is. So that was an after-service thing. Also, in their manual, I gave a number of pages where they'd keep up to date where all their assets were, how they wish to be buried, uh, who to notify, uh, in my wife's case, you know, uh, you know, how to raise our children, you know, things like that. It was, it was an after-the-fact uh, service aspect. And uh, I'll quickly tell my favorite uh, manual testimonial story where a client passed away and the two daughters were arguing about how to bury their mother. One wanted cremation and the other didn't. And all of a sudden, one said, oh, yes, the manual. And they went running to the manual. And sure enough, the mother had written out complete burial instructions. She didn't want to be cremated. And she'd written out where all her bank accounts were. The daughters didn't even know where they were. But it's an element of the third third period of uh, service. No, I think that's a really good example. And those are really good points that there are three distinct different time periods when you're interacting with the clients. Did you teach this to someone or anyone? Like when you stopped practicing law, like are there other people who are now carrying this on and making sure they have these manuals or only people who buy your book? And find out how to do this. Uh, well, uh, people thought I was a little crazy, but a month before I retired, I wrote a 50-page paper on how to improve family law services, which I presented to the 
to the lawyers of Ontario. I, not in just in Ottawa, but in Toronto, and it was webcast. I one of my uh, mission statements is to teach other lawyers. They don't have to buy my <laughs> buy my book. I mean, they, these courses. Uh, you don't get paid for doing these courses. Uh, and and by the way, you don't make any money writing for the ABA. <laughs> you hope not to lose too much money. So, uh, uh, no, I I'm, I just felt that lawyers uh, get a bad rap, but sometimes deservedly so. I mean, every course I went to, they keep saying, could you please return your phone calls? I mean, you know, lawyers still don't even know how to do that. A lot of lawyers don't know how to do that. So I'm trying to change. I think it's... Uh, I have a responsibility to try to change uh, how lawyers practice. It's like banging my head against the wall sometimes. And But I've had people come up to me at courses and say, you know what? I heard you 10 years ago talking about the same thing. I instituted the manual. You know, I like it. Thank you very much. Now, that's very rare because lawyers don't like to thank other people or admit <laughs> things. Uh, but uh, I do get some positive feedback uh, from uh, a few lawyers, you know. Yeah. So I have to ask, while you were practicing, like it's kind of like a chicken or the egg thing. Were you practicing so that you could keep researching or did you love the research so that you could put it into practice? Like, No, I was primarily a lawyer and I had to carve out time to, to do the researching and uh, put it into practice. And, and I had 40 years to do it. That's why there's still a lot on the drawing board. I, you know, I had to eat first, you know. Uh, yeah. But I'm trying to give lawyers a head start with my book. In fact, I have a whole chat. I do all aspects of the application, including creating them and, uh, and put, implementing them, self-help theories in there. And I'm saying, uh, where, people say, well, where do you find them? Well, I say, steal them. <laughs> Use my ideas. The stuff that you can't copyright an idea. Start using, you know, start using manuals. Start slowly with a manual and build it up to be your own. And take some of the articles that I've written, throw them in there. In fact, I was once searching websites for ideas, and I found a form questionnaire. It was from my website. I, I would have wished they had said, Lori, th thank you, we're using your form, you know. But uh, they just they just used the form. And I, I just sort of laughed, you know. Yeah, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> so, Lori, one more question about your book. Well, that's not true. Actually, there's two. But you have a whole chapter on analytics for applications. What is that? And why should lawyers care about that? Uh, that's a good question. We don't analyze anything other than how many hours did you work and what did you bill? Okay, and what's your hourly rate? Uh, we love to financially analyze, but we don't analyze, hey, did the client uh, like their service? I mean, I've talked to very successful lawyers. I said, do you ever even ask the client how they like the service? No, you know, and uh, uh, so we don't analyze at all, uh, which I suggest doing at every phase to see how they like the service so you can improve upon it. Or in that particular case, change your ways. One of my questionnaires was client preference questionnaire. I wanted to know what what the client's, you know, main issues were, what was significant to them, even when they like to return, have phone calls, return things like that. We don't analyze things. And one of the main simple things that we don't analyze, and this is a marketing tool, and that is I couldn't open up for years. I couldn't open up a file. My procedure was unless I knew why the person came to me. So uh, I'm glad to see that some of the accounting programs now do that, but in those days they didn't. I had to trick it. I had, to, I, I, I could get how many people came to me because of the internet, and I realized that it was a lot—15, 20, 25 percent at times. So based upon that statistic, I put more effort into the website. The yellow pages, as they then were, were popular. About I, I put money in that, and it worked. And then when I saw that it wasn't working, I got out of that. I realized that certain newspapers weren't working. So I uh, I analyzed where uh, where I got my clients, how much money it, it was worth, and adjusted my market uh, accordingly. Yeah, I think that is a really good point, and that definitely rings true, right? Other than maybe an annual review, or if you're up for like a lateral promotion, you pretty much don't really ask for feedback. But you know, I hope that lawyers want to change and improve. 
And so, Lori, where can they buy your book? Speaking of financial, <laughs> what can they do? <laughs> they, well, the ABA uh, is a big, you know, it's a big publisher. They publish a number of books a year, and they have a site, Shop My ABA. And uh, on that site, um, just like Amazon. Okay, I was going to say, remember, I think I told you, uh, I got the ABA mm -hmm. to allow people, they buy the book before the end of March and use this code, which is, uh, got it here, I-L-S-A-I-D-E-S-2-3. Well, you'll print it up. I will. I think that's the initials <laughs> for your book. But, uh, they'll give 25% off the cost of the Okay. Book. Worth Excellent. every penny. I mean, look, we're talking about financials. We're talking about being smart. So definitely you want to save 25% on your purchase of the book. I will put that code here on the screen. And this code is valid through the end of March. Okay. So March right. 31st, 2023. And if you are listening to the podcast, thank you for listening. I want to remind you that this podcast is available on YouTube in case you want to see what I look like or Lori and check out all his books in the background, all of this stuff. Um, but I will include this discount code in the show notes as well. Okay, so if you're interested in buying the book, Innovative Legal Service Applications, a guide to improve client services, please use the code that is listed there in the show notes. Okay, but don't go just yet. We're not done. Just had to okay. put a little commercial. <laughs> Thank you very much for the commercial. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. So Lori, do you have advice for new lawyers, lawyers who have been practicing for five years or less? or any law students about the practice of law? That I do. In fact, I could go on forever about that. <laughs> uh, basically, um, you've got to evolve. If you want to enjoy the practice, get into slowly try, trying to improve yourself and start trying to prove uh, your practice. In fact, I also have a chapter, I call it my self-help chapter, about how to make sure that these applications get get put into place because lawyers have so much to do. It's not billable time. It's probably not recognized by other lawyers in the firm. How do they make sure things get done? And uh, the golden rule there is focus. Do one thing at a time. I was not great at that. You know, you, you start on a project and you read the magazine, some other idea, and you jump to the other idea, and not come back to the, the first one. So focus on doing one thing at a time and there's a Japanese principle called Kaizen, uh, where just small improvements. Just start with a manual with next to nothing in it and slowly building up. In the end, I had maps of the parking, you know, the parking lots near the courthouse. I had memos on uh, how to address, uh, how to this, you know, uh, what, what my cell phone number was if you couldn't find in the courthouse or where the elevators were. I mean, just slowly build up, but slowly from the beginning, try to improve yourself. Uh, what's the many self-help books that are out there and try to improve your practice and don't expect that you're going to have overnight success. It takes the uh, time. I know I'm asking for a major shift in how lawyers think, but I really think they'll enjoy the law as much as I did because I enjoyed being a lawyer. You got to think like a client, not like a lawyer and clients and the, the clients can, they're not great at judging how good a lawyer you are. What do they know? They're not a lawyer. And they don't know if someone's the wrong, not a great judge or great arguments, but they can judge the service. Um, I think that's an excellent point. Think like a client. You don't hear that often. Yeah. In fact, I always say to people, you know, sometimes when you go into your office, sit in the client's chair, just look and see what the client sees, you know, and feel like a client, you know. So I say what's important to clients may not be important to lawyers if they don't realize it. And the other way around, too. Yeah. That is so true. I love that. That's a really good shift in perspective. And that's good for anyone, right? It's good for law students who are listening. It's good for new lawyers. And even, you know, return listeners who have been practicing for a number of years. That's always a good point. So. Yeah. Well, I'd say about law students, <laughs> they don't know anything yet. I mean, you they think they know something, but they don't know anything. I mean, I... Uh, your knowledge keeps increasing, increasing. You can always learn. Uh, and uh, I think actually, that's why I think my book, Sort of Active and Sal, it appeals to the starting out people. But later on, lo older lawyers will appreciate what I've got to say because they'll recognize it in their own their own practice. We all have our war stories, you know, but they're 
they're often very similar. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate you coming on the You Are Lawyer podcast and sharing your information and discussing your book with us today. Well, thanks very much for having me. Yeah. So thank you all for listening and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye now.